So um, now next session we are going to discuss about graphical modeling and deep learning. Uh, I'll just give a brief um, introduction. So Judy Pearl, he's called the god of causality because he's the one who kind of, he's the same guy who actually introduced uh, graphical modeling and he's the one who um, introduced causality. And he got a lot of attack when he introduced probabilistic graphical modeling. He also got a lot of attack when he's causality. But since causality is a very infant um, field, um, he's still being attacked. Um, but uh, so this, if you want to know, like this is the go-to book causality. Uh, talking about God of causality, so if you need a God, Gautam Buddha could be one because he's like Pratit, I can't pronounce it, but his, his philosophies are very based on cause and effect, you know? This is because of that, that dependent origination. Anybody knows about this? Or anybody know how to pronounce this word? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so he, he actually uh, introduced uh, this cause, concept of causality in a more formal way. Um, and so this is interesting. So now Judia Pearl has given this uh, open challenge. He says that all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting, because all regression. To build truly intelligent machines, teach them cause and effect. That's his claim. So now the question is, and this is the, his new book, The Book of Why, which is kind of sensational and interesting, if you want to read. Um, the question is like, is Judea Pearl a deep learning Luddite, right? Or is he a provocative Gandalf? Like, is he a wise guy or is he a Luddite? Like, like um, so Luddite are the people who kind of like um, push back against the industrialization. Because even Einstein, like when we, he didn't, he couldn't accept the quantum uh, world, right? He said the famous, he said the God doesn't play dice with the universe. So you know, so I mean, is he not getting the deep potential of deep learning, or is it like really being very far sighted and like saying for truth that hey, you know, only deep learning is not going to go that deep. You need to go into the causality. Uh, or do we even need to think in terms of like either or, or you know? Uh, when talking about graphical model and deep learning. So are we at the verge of creating AI's own unified theory, you know, or AI's own Maxwell's equation? Are you on that? Like, I don't know. So, but now today we have these uh, two researchers, uh, Professor Suresh Manandar and Chris, who have been actually working. Um, Suresh, he has been, he's one of the veteran AI. He has been working for so long. And there's uh, Chris, who is actually... We have these two very crucial, so that's why like now we are going to have the more discussion from the horse mouth, Professor Suresh Manander, to give his views on this. I have all this formal foundational stuff, and then all of a sudden people start throwing accusations about entire subjects. Uh, so, and I remember actually when I started doing research for the first time, being really thrown off by this. Because up until I had started doing research, it was... Like, all the critiques I ever got were, like, no, Chris, your math is wrong, or your code is buggy. Like, uh, you know, these are, these are important things, right? You need to first understand the foundations. You need to get the technique right. And I hope through this school, you're beginning to get acquainted with some of these, like, fundamental techniques and then build some fluency, just, you know, knowing the math, knowing the, the programming, right? Um, but then after I started doing research, people started giving critiques that were totally unrelated to the actual execution, right? Um, like, they would say, like, yes, the math is right, the code works, but everything you've done is wrong. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of what we're, we're seeing in this sort of discussion, right? Um, kind of, uh, one thing I'd caution is, better to be a pragmatist in a lot of things. Um, I think, and, and especially I would caution you against developing really strong opinions about things before you've really understood them. I much prefer people who say, you know, I don't know which approach I like more than the other um, because I just don't know enough, right? I think that's a much more mature view. Um, but Judeo Pearl, of course, can say whatever he wants. Uh, and uh, speaking of people with strong opinions, um, this is from the abstract of one of the, this debate has been going on for a long time, but under kind of different 
uh, masks, right? So this paper uh, came out, I think it's like 1995, 1996. Uh, statistical modeling of the two cultures. Uh, what are some of the provocative statements in here? Um, uh, this commitment has led to irrelevant theory, questionable conclusions, and has kept statisticians from working on a large range of interesting current problems. Uh, and this was published in the journal Statistical Science. So you can imagine this create quite an uproar in the statistics community. Um, but what he was trying to get at was uh, there's this point of view in modeling where you try to specify the relationships between all your variables ahead of time. Uh, you build a full generative mechanism for this is how my data emerged in terms of probability. And then you just try to, es you try to fit that model. Uh, but what Breiman was saying was that this kind of exercise of trying to specify relationships between variables ahead of time is uh, it's not necessary to do good data analysis, right? So Breiman invented the random forest. And if you've ever worked with random forest, there's no statement about probability anywhere in the, the description. Um, but it's a really useful model in a lot of different settings, right? Um, so yeah, it's, he had an interesting perspective. And, and part of it, I think, uh, kind of aside from the actual thesis he makes here, part of it comes from his background. So he was famous for, at the beginning of his career, writing a probability theory textbook. And then he left academia. Uh, and he did all sorts of consulting in the real world. Um, I think the, one of his first ideas for doing random forest came from, he was consulting for the city of LA, trying to do smog prediction. So the, this was in the 1970s. There was a really big smog problem in the city. They wanted to be able to predict uh, kind of a few days out, is there going to be a lot of smog or not? So we can try to do some sort of uh, precaution or like intervention. Um, and he realized, like, oh, you don't need to actually uh, have a probability to say whether there's going to be smog or not. Right? So he started thinking in that way. Um, so having that outsider perspective, he was able to, to kind of clarify this distinction. Um, then uh, a few decades later, it's not just two cultures, it is five tribes. So people like doing anthropology of science, right? And they break it down in all sorts of ways. Um, so this one, kind of deep learning and Bayesian statistics are, are two of the five, right? So it's kind of reflecting that earlier distinction between people who do probability in their modeling and people who don't but who have more flexible tools. Uh, this is a, a famous paper, uh, Rise of the Machines. It's uh, kind of the rise of the machine learning people from the statistics perspective. I think one of my favorite stories about this paper is that when they asked, or like when he tried to publish it, the editors said like, no, you can't include the Terminator on the first page. <laughs> that would be a copyright violation. <laughs> And so he didn't publish it, he just put it on his website. Uh, so I think this is really standing by his principles there. Uh, oh yeah, and, and more provocative statements. Um, so uh, departments that eschew machine learning do so at their own risk and may find themselves in the rubble of an outdated, antiquated field. So this is, uh, again, like totally non-technical arguments, but people get very passionate about them. Um, but okay, so like what exactly are the, just if I summarize all their arguments in one page, like what are the strengths and weaknesses of this di these different approaches, right? Um, okay, it's just stepping through them. So in graphical modeling, again, like you get statements about uncertainty, right? You know, everything Dovan was talking about, building these probability tables, you can actually start saying things like for this particular student, this is the, the probability that they actually know the concept or not, which is a, a really useful information, right? And that's why it makes it useful in science, uh, and it also makes it easy to combine information, right? Because uh, probability gives you a, a, a way of saying, you know, if I see many different students, even though they all behave a little bit differently, I can kind of build a single model that shares information across all of them, and it's very natural in probability. Uh, kind of the downsides, uh, it's not designed to scale, right? So kind of just the, this is maybe more just 
what departments these fields emerged from. They tended to emerge from fields with a little bit less data in general, like less sensor or uh, kind of automatically generated data. Um, so it was much more like a, an art. It's like a handcrafted uh, design on smaller data. Right? So that's kind of the, the weakness. Right? It's, it's less automatic. Uh, it's less huge data scenario. Kind of. This comes in contrast with, I'm calling it algorithmic modeling, but for our purposes, we can think of it as deep learning. Uh, here, the focus is all about computation, right? Kind of deep learning people were the first people to use GPUs, right? And that reflects the, the culture. Um, there's also uh, kind of a lot of focus on building kind of modular, uh, easy to use, uh, kind of automatic models, right? The downside is you don't have as much theory. Uh, you don't have statements about uncertainty anymore. You're just kind of modeling averages of things. Uh, and then the, uh, the last is a little bit more of a, the subtle, and I think this is a, the most important, uh, one of the most important weaknesses in algorithmic modeling is that it kind of thinks about all the data as being big, homogeneous things, right? Like think about ImageNet. ImageNet is just you know, millions of natural images that all sort of look like each other and they all come from the same classes and it's been very well curated. It's helped the field advance a lot, but it's not really representative of the real world, right? In the real world, what data actually tend to look like are, it's almost like a, like a pastiche of all sorts of small data sets, right? It's like, um, think about uh, any sort of recommendation engine, right? When you are recommending movies to someone, uh, each different person has their own kind of mini data set, right? And this huge data set you've collected of all the movie viewing behavior is a combination of all these smaller data sets, right? And it's not IID between people anymore, right? So in a way, this, is, this kind of begs for some sort of way of pooling evidence, which is like the graphical modeling point of view. Um, but on the other hand, like these data sets are so much larger than anything people thought about in graphical modeling that it's, it's really hard to actually to pull this off, right? Um, so I think that is going to suggest a kind of a synthesis, which we'll revisit a little bit later. Um, but I also want to give, because this is all sort of like abstract conceptual stuff, I want to just give a few examples that you can keep in mind. So when you hear this sort of debate, just what are people actually talking about, right? Um, so algorithmic modeling, kind of a, a classical example. This is a, an image from the Netflix Prize website. So what the Netflix Prize was is uh, Netflix released a data set in, I think it must have been like 2007, uh, quite a while ago now, where they just gave uh, millions of user ratings of movies. And what you were supposed to do is predict what the rating would be uh, if this person who had not watched this one movie, if they had watched it, what would their rating have been? Right, so that's the task. Um, it's a pure prediction problem. You don't need to do any sort of scientific analysis. You don't need to say, like, oh, what's the probability uh, that they would like it or not? You just needed to make a prediction, and you'd be ranked by how, how good your predictions were. Um, and it was a big moment in uh, the machine learning community because people kind of all focused their energy on this one problem. They made a lot of progress. Uh, it opened up some new research areas. Okay, here's another kind of algorithmic modeling problem. Um, the, the question is, there are these street view cars driving down all these different roads. Uh, it sees these numbers on, on homes. This is a lot harder than just MNIST, right? This is not just like uh, the post office scanned in and curated this very uh, clear handwritten digit data set. These uh, house numbers come in all sorts of forms. And what you want to do is you want to create on the Google map to say uh, these are the home numbers along the road. And it's sometimes it's trickier than it seems, right? Sometimes the home numbers can be just like only odd uh, on the street, uh, maybe they're jumps, right? So you need to really use this computer vision uh, really well. Um, and this is all also like, uh, it's not scientific, but it's a huge task. Uh, it's way too hard for any person to do, so you need to try to figure out how to automate it. Okay, and then I wanted to give a, 
an example of still kind of algorithmic modeling, right? It's not doing kind of what we would say is like an uncertainty estimation, but which is a little bit more like a directly socially relevant. So this is an interesting paper from this year about uh, taking videos from hospitals. Uh, we wanted to see kind of how are people walking, right? And then use that to tailor the treatments for people, right? So this is for older, older seniors. Um, you might have like different clusters of how people behave in their uh, like gait patterns, and you might tailor different kinds of therapy according to that, right? So I think of this as like a sensing problem, right? It's like you can see it as a person, but to kind of scientifically uh, to scientifically design like what are your treatments going to be, you need some way of sensing it in a more kind of computational way, right? Um, but then they do it entirely using just computer vision and deep learning, right? So they don't have any sense of, this is my uncertainty, this is my sharing information across different uh, people. Okay, and then some graphical modeling examples, right? So that was all uh, algorithmic modeling. A lot of them are computer vision. Um, a lot of them are from technology, like sensors. Um, in graphical modeling, these are more scientific examples, right? So this is from a, a paper called Module Networks. The idea is that uh, the expression of a gene uh, is affected by upstream kind of regulatory elements is what they're called. So like a, if a suppressor gene is on, then all the genes that it suppresses will be off, right? And you can write that down as a causal model, just like what Devon was talking about, right? Um, so kind of now you have kind of a full description of the gene network um, that's, that's in some system, right? Um, so it's a very different flavor, right? It's less about deploying something in the real world and more about your scientific understanding of how something works. Uh, here's another uh, graphical model. This one is kind of directly about causal inference. Right, so this is, does cigarette smoking uh, relate to multiple sclerosis, right? Um, so they, they kind of lay out a kind of set of causal assumptions. They try to think about what are the, pot the potential confounders or the potential latent variables, and they adjust for them. And then they're able to make estimates about like, to what degree uh, does smoking affect multiple sclerosis. And here's another kind of graphical modeling approach, right? Uh, so again, we're going to try to get some sort of error, like an uncertainty estimation. Uh, this one is about how do you find exoplanets, right? So in the exoplanets paper, it's not like you just uh, analyze a telescope measurements and then make a prediction using some deep learning model. Like, you actually have to lay out the science of, you know, this is how... Uh, like I ex this is like my physical theory of how exoplanets form and how, like where I would expect them to be in the universe. And this is how they might affect the, the kind of telescope sensor measurements that I have. And then you develop these sort of like calibrated kind of with error bar estimates of the behavior of planets. And then you are able to find a few that seem like, okay, this, these are kind of consistent with my understanding of what exoplanets would look like. Okay, do you want to take over, or I can continue? Uh, you can continue this one. Okay, Until okay. One. okay. Um, so now, the first few slides of what I had shown would make you think that this is like some sort of a, like a tug of war, like one side's gonna win at the end, and then uh, the other side will be forgotten by history, but really what, ends up happening is that the two fields begin to blend. And the, they kind of, the strength of one field is the weakness of the other, and vice versa, and then by kind of combining, you can get uh, something that's you know, the best of both worlds, right? Uh, so what do the directions look like? Right, so from kind of graphical modeling to deep learning, the things that are really beneficial, one is you can deal with uncertainty, right? So like all these sort of error bars, you wouldn't be able to do it uh, unless you had some sort of probability. Uh, heterogeneity, right? So 
you want to be able to deal with, like whenever we talk about personalized medicine, when we talk about personalized recommendations, we need to be able to say that you know, there is going to be variation from person to person. And probability is an excellent language to say uh, how do you combine information from person to person. And then again, causality, right? Uh, you know, I did not learn another language by looking at a billion pairs of labeled examples, but that's how a lot of modern translation systems work, right? So if you have a better notion of how to, how we actually reason causally, uh, then you might build a better machine learning system in the end. And then the other way around, like uh, machine learning has a lot to offer st statistics, right? Um, I think the, f the most important lesson for statistics is that as you're trying to model a richer and richer universe, your models are going to need to become more and more complex. Um, like this is not this is not something like we shouldn't be embarrassed by all the data that's out there anymore. We should actually try to make something to use. Um, so again, that's also like computational focus. Like uh, we've been in statistics using linear algebra for things, but we never used a GPUs. We might make classical statistical models way more efficient by adopting some of these best computational practices. And then also modularity, right? It's so easy for people in deep learning to c combine different pieces of models to come up with a new one that's adapted for their specific problem. But at least until the last couple of years in statistics, every time you had a new model, or you had a new algorithm, uh, you had to write it up from scratch. And that's just a, a much slower uh, kind of w workflow, right? Um, so I think in statistics, if you can have f more efficient workflows, then like then it can start moving at the same pace as the rest of machine learning, right? So what at the beginning looks like you know Terminator, two cultures, five tribes, in the end there's uh, a lot that's that's kind of coming together, and I think it again speaks to you know, there are people who might have extremist views about these kind of like philosophical questions in machine learning and, and statistics and everything. Um, but it's much better to be a pragmatist, I think, right? Um, because in the end, we just want to solve problems, right? Um, in the end, like I deliberately chose data sets where they were kind of tricky to collect, right? These days, you see so many papers where we uh, you know, just try another uh, kind of classical, we do MNIST, or we do some benchmark, and you forget that the data are actually really complicated to collect, and that every single data set results from some sort of intervention with the world, right? Where a, you, a human has to interact to like build a sensor, uh, put a camera somewhere, um, uh, enter something into a, a survey, right? There's always human interaction, and then that's, that's what we end up building models over, right? It's not, it's not oil, it's not electricity. Like, data does not just exist in the universe, right? We interact with the world to create data. Um, and, then, and then we use that to solve problems, right? So, like, take that high level view, and then it becomes clear, like, to solve problems, use what works, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there's really no point getting into these kind of, uh, philosophical quibbles when what you really want to do is solve a problem. Yeah. Okay. Chris hasn't finished yet, so he's going to come back. Um, okay, so um, to summarize in terms of you know where we are um, at the moment, so just to recap on what Chris already said, um, we have kind of nice uh, graphical models, probabilistic models, where we have uh, nice uh, probabilistic distributions that we like, um, and we can generate est estimates on uncertainty uh, using these models, right? So that's one side of the equation. The other side is we have deep learning, uh, which just says, okay, you know, we don't need to care about these things necessarily and we can still do very good predictions, right? Um, but, uh, so uh, going forward, you know, how do we combine these models? Clearly, you know, one thing uh, that we need to change might be that 
even though our distributions may look nice, it may still not be a good reflection on how the world behaves, right? So we don't know uh, beforehand that these are the kind of right distributions for the problems at hand. So there's still a lot of work remaining to make sure that you know our uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, you know, catches up with the requirements of of, of the real world. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, so obviously, uh, progress is being being made uh, in trying to combine uh, graphical models with deep learning, right? So, um, just to give you some idea about how things were only a few years ago. So I, I spent a lot of time doing uh, graphical models for natural language processing. And the story kind of goes like this. You know, you come up with a nice uh, probabilistic model, and then you write down very complicated uh, sampling equations by hand, which takes forever. And you know, you're not 100% sure that <laughs> your derivations are correct. Uh, and then uh, you, uh, run it on the computer, and then it takes about uh, four weeks to train. And then after four weeks, you realize that, oh, by the way, there was a bug there somewhere. Uh, you know, something didn't work. And then you um, fix it, and then you take another four more weeks to train. And then after that, you realize that actually your model was not quite correct. So you have to redo the whole equations, introduce some additional bugs, and then, then take two more months to train again. Right, so that's uh, where things were. Um, um, so now uh, we have formalisms uh, such as uh, Pyro or uh, Edward, which allows you to combine uh, deep learning with graphical models. So this is a kind of an example we have, and actually Chris already showed some of this example using Pyro. So. Um, <clears throat> So the nice thing about uh, this kind of example, so let me just take you through this. So we have a variable x, right? We sample some ones from there, <clears throat> and then we, <clears throat> we supply that uh, into the theta here. The theta is being drawn from a beta distribution. Uh, so those samples are now from the beta distribution, and you feed it to the Bernoulli. So this is, uh, is effectively generating uh, samples from the beta Bernoulli distribution, but doesn't require the formula for the beta Bernoulli distribution. So it is done via explicit sampling, right? So that is the nice thing about this approach. Okay, so now you don't have to do that complicated maths that uh, you know I was doing and making mistakes. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, the disadvantage of uh, this approach is that uh, in the sampling process, you're losing some information, right? So there are the pros and cons to this approach. Um, so similarly, you can uh, define uh, your uh, GAN uh, using a very few lines of code, right? So the nice thing here is that uh, because you're doing explicit sampling, um, you can actually now introduce uh, some uh, deep learning into these models, so you can see the dense layers there, uh, both in the generator and the discriminator. And you can imagine that you know, now you can plug in uh, your CNNs or whatever else. So you can plug in your black box deep learning solutions inside your graphical models. So this has the great advantage that, uh, number one, you can uh, take advantage of your deep learning modules. That's number one advantage. Number two, you don't have to do that complicated maths, which I was doing and making mistakes. So that's the second advantage. And third, now you can run this uh, in your GPUs, right? So you have lots of advantages. Um, but as I said, the disadvantage is that we still don't know that our simplistic uh, distributions we're using, the simplistic graphical models we're using is actually the right thing. I think, you know, Chris also tried to highlight that point. <coughs> So here is uh, some example. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best. I had a very quick read. Um, I might get this wrong, but uh, do you want to say this? Oh. 
Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll have a go and Chris will correct me. So the, <clears throat> so the idea here is that, um, <clears throat> so you want to do this histopathology classification, and what they've done is that they've taken patches and, you know, put a deep uh, neural network, uh, and the same neural, the deep neural net network is fed uh, multiple patches. But the point here is that now they have a probabilistic model uh, which combines the output um, <clears throat> of these patches to generate the final uh, classification. Yeah, so so it is a nice example of combining a probabilistic model with a with a deep neural network. So maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Chris to talk about this one. So uh, this is another kind of way of combining. Uh, classical deep learning with, this is actually some causal inference, which is just like what we were talking about earlier today. This example, what they're trying to do is they want to see how does uh, forcing people, like students, to take an online course, how does that online course affect down, uh, downstream student achievement? And of course, just like what Dovan was mentioning, you might have confounding, right? You might have, you don't want to, you, you need to have some sort of, uh, uh, adjustment for the fact that maybe some schools the students are, are better primed to do well uh, anyways right um, so uh, the idea was okay let's uh, do some sort of causal inference uh, looking at the effect of this uh, this online game on eventual student performance right so that would be kind of classical causal inference graphical modeling point of view what they did in this paper that's a little bit different from traditional graphical modeling is that uh, you might, so so far we've been talking about the intervention as like you cause something or you don't cause something, right? But in reality, it might be a little bit more subtle than that. In reality, what might happen is when you have a certain kind of context, like a, when you're in a certain kind of school or you're a certain kind of student, then the effect of this intervention might be different from if you're in another kind of school or are another kind of student. Like maybe if you uh, kind of go to a, a school where the teachers are already very fluent with e education technology, then the effect might be stronger, for example, right? So how do you think about variation and like a heterogeneity in causal effects? One way to do it is to fit a function that says like this is the, the size of the causal effect as I vary different kinds of input data x. So yes, it's actually, that's just curve fitting, as Judeo Pearl would say, right? Um, but then you can kind of add this curve fitting element to causal inference, and then you get something that's a little bit better than either would have been on its own, right? So this is, this, all this image is showing is, you know, these are different initial school achievement levels, and then these are just different methods they tried to use. These are like different uh, kind of deep learning plus causal inference techniques to see oh, in this range, you have the strongest uh, causal effect. You know, in this range, you have somewhat smaller causal effects. So that was kind of a neat example. Okay, and this one too. Um, so this is from uh, Don Woodard's group at Cornell. Uh, what they were interested in doing is, what is the, how long does it take for an ambulance to get to a particular intersection in the city? Right, so this is the city of Toronto. Uh, the the color is how long did it take for that? Uh, oh no, this is a little different. Oh yeah, it's the probability that the the uh, the ambulance arrived within four minutes, which is uh, an important measure, right? So this is uh, like they're using some complicated nonlinear modeling to do this, but it's important here that they are actually using probability, right? Because if I tell you like a, make a prediction for how long it's going to take for this ambulance to get to this intersection, and I tell you, like, three minutes. That's not, that's not good if it turns out to be like, well, three minutes on average, but sometimes it takes half an hour, right? That's a, a totally different story than saying, like, three minutes, but then maybe two and a half or three and a half. Right? It's very, very important here to have some sort of uncertainty estimate, right? And that's exactly what they were able to do here, right? So here they're showing the distance, how long it takes, along with some error bar around, you know, some of the trips are going to take longer than others just by chance, 
let's have some understanding of how much longer it might take. So, um, so far, you know, uh, if you try to assess the progress in this field, so if you look at deep probabilistic programming, so as I said earlier, we, we don't need to derive sampling equations such as your uh, MCMC or Gibbs sampling. Um, but as I also said, uh, explicit sampling means that you actually have some loss in your accuracy. Um, but the advantage you gain is that because your know, computations are now GPU bound, so you have really fast computation. So the things that were taking me four weeks to train, I could probably train now in like one hour or a couple of hours. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, we have the advantage that now we can integrate uh, black box deep learning models into our graphical models. So that's uh, the plus side of things. <clears throat> However, uh, there is a huge amount of progress to be made. So I would not claim that I'm an expert in this field, but my very uh, cursory look uh, at where things are, uh, seems to me that, you know, for example, integration of graphical models within reinforcement learning is still, uh, you know, I haven't seen many papers in that. And also, uh, there's a whole new area of uh, neural Turing machines. I'll show you some examples of that in the next one or two slides. Uh, so the key point about uh, <clears throat> neural Turing machines is that, you know, we have some explicit memory and we have a controller which can read and write into this memory. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, but there is almost no work in terms of integrating probabilistic programming within neural Turing machines. And also, you know, um, our current uh, integration of graphical, uh, graphical models within uh, neural networks is fairly limited in that, you know, ideally we want to have some sort of search of uh, lots of different possible graphical models. So we, we, we want to be able to search through it. Because we do, you know, so that's going to give us a lot more flexibility. But we currently don't know how to do that very well. So here are some examples. So this is a, a variant of the neural Turing machine. It's known as a differentiable neural computer. And the idea here is that you have an explicit, uh, so you have input, your output, and you have these heads, so these heads can write and read. So in this particular case, it has two read heads and one write head. And furthermore, uh, you have links uh, between memory locations, and these links are, for example, useful uh, to encode temporal uh, relationship between these various uh, memory locations. And then you have a controller which can also allocate and deallocate memory locations. So here's some example of you know, this uh, machine running. And the DNC has been pretty successful in solving a range of problems. For example, trying to solve the traveling salesman's problem. So find an optimal route um, uh, for the London Underground. So you can see uh, <coughs> that uh, you know, it can do allocation on memory. It, can has, it has a notion of which memory locations are free, et cetera. Okay, so I just want to uh, conclude uh, this little uh, discussion we're having. Um, so in terms of more general kind of closing remarks. So, um, <clears throat> you know, ML and AI are very highly relevant disciplines for developing countries. So this is a point uh, a lot of us have stressed uh, over the last uh, 10 days. Um, so what is nice about this kind of technology is that it requires very few resources. So one of the things you don't need, you don't need to have a lab, like a proper you know, hardware lab or, uh, well, you, you might, but at least to do a lot of the work you don't. You don't need a chemistry lab, right? So you could do, actually do, make progress and learn about these technologies uh, just from your bedroom, right? And you can still make a contribution in this field so that is a you know big plus for developing countries. You know we should not uh, underestimate how powerful that is. <clears throat> so um, we can already see that AI and ML can have a transformative effect in many many sectors. And just to name a few: health, education, IT, 
the economy, uh, new job creations. And we've also been discussing a lot about, you know, black box versus open box solutions. So it is not the case that, you know, we should, uh, you know, black box solutions are totally useless. Obviously, you know, both have its place. Uh, so both are important. However, to make an impact in this field, we need to go deeper, right? And develop uh, newer open box solutions. And this 10, 11 days is, has been about that, to get you trained, uh, to get you deeper into the workings of machine learning and AI algorithms, right? So one of the take home messages uh, from the last 10, 11 days is that, you know, we, I would strongly urge all of you to seek uh, stronger mathematical foundations. So that is very, very important. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we haven't scared you, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's very important that, you know, you, you feel that, okay, it looked very hard, but actually maybe it wasn't that hard, you know? Maybe you could go home and look at the slides again, even the slides that you didn't understand. You know, if you read it a few times, maybe you gain a lot deeper understanding. I think, I think you know, that's really, really important uh, from my perspective. And I, I'm sure, you know, uh, a lot of our colleagues here who've been teaching you uh, feels the same. <clears throat> also, as uh, Chris has said, and I strongly agree, that do not believe the hype. There is far too much hype going on uh, about, uh, you know, what AI and ML, what deep learning is going to do in the next few years. Uh, most of that is hype, I would say. Um, there is a huge amount of progress still uh, that needs to be made. And hopefully, you know, you can contribute to that knowledge. And you can, you know, uh, as I said, um, being in a developing country, uh, the fact that uh, AI and ML now doesn't require a lot of resources apart from a laptop, you know, you should feel the, very strongly that, you know, you can gain the knowledge needed, you can gain the foundations needed to make a contribution in this field. I think that's a very, very important uh, message I hope, you know, you're able to take away. And <clears throat> so as I say, you know, um, finally the winter schools should have helped you hopefully to gain a deeper understanding and separate the noise um, and really understand what's really going on, okay?